So I'm just back here in the burned out area. Came back for another swing through and boy, it's just beautiful out here. We're surrounded by lodgepole pines, dug firs, few hemlocks, few vine maples, plenty of cedars. And boy, there's just a ton of small little morels starting to come up. We're still definitely early, but check this out. So this is what we're seeing up here on the higher bench. Plenty of burned morels. And we can see right here at the base, these little cups. This is Geopixis genus. Geopixis carbonaria. If you're looking around a burned area and you're trying to determine whether or not you're in the right spot, a lot of times looking for those little ascomycetes is a great way to kind of key into those areas or just to kind of signal that, hey, this is the right type of habitat for me to be looking. So we'll, we'll check in on some other little details here in a sec and we'll see what we can do to kind of clue in to some of those signposts that inform us that we're right where we want to be. So cool to see out here. Love being back out here in the burn. And for any of you around near a burn, I'd encourage you to get out, poke around, see what you see because they're starting to come up. We're still early, but they're out here. So check this out. So I just harvested this morel and you'll notice that it's got almost like a greenish hue. So a lot of these smaller burn morels that we're seeing are like a dark black or a gray even. But take a look at this one. It's got a little bit of a different look. Now it's worth noting that there are a few different types of burn morels that we're likely to encounter out here. In fact, here in the Pacific Northwest, there are four basic species that we expect to see. Morchella eczema, sextillata, exuberans, and tomentosa. Of those, the really the only one that's super easy to identify is the tomentosa. So that would, if this is not the tomentosa, but if it was, it would have a darkened stipe right down there at the bottom. And so, and it may have a little bit of a furry appearance. Some of these other ones can be called greenies or pickles or, and there's different ways to look at like, you know, say for instance, if we look over here, even glancing down at kind of the different folding pattern that's in the stipe. Some people claim that they can kind of differentiate these different burn morel species from those different patterns, the eczema, sextillata and exuberance. But in my experience, it's very difficult to differentiate those three burn morel species. And in fact, there's a lot of evidence that, you know, these are super complex mushrooms. So you'll hear about people hunting, not just first year burns, which tend to be the most abundant, but also second year burns. So I'm kind of curious actually to do that. That's something I've never really put any time into those second year burns, but I know that a lot of people claim to have pretty good success in those areas. So that's something that maybe at a future date I'll have to explore. What I've heard from mycologists such as uh, I know Larry Evans has mentioned that you know he's been hunting morels for 30 years planning his springtime season around the morel hunt and I've heard him reference that the there's a lot of complexity in the genetic makeup of these morels so oftentimes we don't even know for sure if we're dealing with populations or individuals. And he reference, references mosaics of these different types of morels popping up. And it's, he suggests there's, this is not um, by any means, you know, like fact, but there's a lot of debate over, you know, the morels that we see in these burn sites, the true identity of them is very, very tricky from a genetic standpoint. And there's evidence to suggest that the morels that we may see after the first year, right? So the first year burn morels are totally different genetically than the morels that we're gonna see in a second year burn. So 
All that stuff, super interesting to me. There's more questions than answers oftentimes. But boy, I love seeing these different kind of types of morels. I think that I have a feeling that these are all um, likely of a similar strain, but boy, I can't help but marvel at some of the different looks that I'm getting on morels out here in the burn today. So super cool to see, just figured I would pause and reference that. So awesome stuff. So just harvested this one and what I noticed is this tiny little hole underneath the cap here. So what I'm gonna do is go ahead and slice this guy open. Just make sure that it's not too buggy. So let's just give that a little cut. Let's see what we're looking at here. Whew, looking pretty good. Exactly what we were hoping for. See one little bug in there that I'll go ahead and relieve of his duties. But nice to be able to confirm that we've got a good one before we chuck it in the bucket. So cool to see. So I'm just in at the burn here, steep slope. Pretty seriously burnt out area. And check this out. So I just came across this. Thought this was super interesting. So we've got this totally burnt out snag here and you can see on there the charred remains of a conch likely the red belted conch Phomatopsis muncieae and check this out so here we go totally burnt out wood we've got fresh little fruitings Phomatopsis muncieae starting to do its thing in spite of the burn so very cool you know there must be some some good source of nutrients still left in that wood, maybe not fully burnt out. So very cool to see out here in the burn. So just moving through the edge of the burn out here, kind of near the river, got a bunch of cottonwoods going. You can see all these cottonwood buds littering the forest floor here. And we've got a really cool sight. The first thimble morel or early spring morel of the season, at least for me. This is Verpa bohemica. This one, not everybody eats it but others revere it as a delicacy. There's a little bit of a controversy over this one. Awesome to see though. I think I'll go ahead and harvest it. And just down here on the edge of the burn, got beautiful peaks out there in the distance, a lot of cottonwoods on the opposite shore, just budding out. And we're still in the burn here. I just saw a really interesting mushroom that I figured I'd pick, point out really quickly. This is one that we featured in detail in a video in the past, some of you may recognize this as the split gill. So if you look up top, we've got a white kind of fuzzy surface. If I pan underneath, we've got this really cool split gill structure. This is again, commonly referred to as the split gill mushroom, Schizophyllum commune. And this one has a long history of use, both as an edible and a medicinal mushroom. But again, you may recall there's a little controversy over this because this is one that has been found growing on humans. So inside of humans even. So there's a little bit of debate over this one, but again, it's been used for thousands of years. And here you can see the gill structure underneath. So. Not exactly what we're after today, but very cool to see. Just figured I'd just pause real quick, point that out. Mm -hmm. 
So earlier we were focusing the bulk of our efforts a little up on a shelf that was primarily lodgepole pine, cedar, dug fir, a little bit of hemlock in there. And we just shifted our efforts. And so we relocated here just as I was about to kind of look back up to the shelf, I spotted this guy under big leaf maple. Just beautiful. Look at that. So cool to see. So maybe we'll stay down here a little longer. See what this lower bench down by the river has to offer. So I was just filming that one lonely morel over there. And my buddy hollered at me. Take a look at what he discovered here. So we're in that same kind of lowland forest near a river. And look at all these. As you start to look closely, they just jump out at you everywhere. Look at all these. Beautiful flush of burn morels just popping up out here right now. And boy, the more that I look, the more that I'm seeing these. And this is, again, an entirely different habitat. I mean, obviously it shares in common that it's also a burn area, right? So it's got that in common with where we were earlier with the lodgepole pines and all. But this, much different feel here. And in amongst the cottonwoods and all the other deciduous trees that are down here in this floodplain, seems like the morels don't mind. Each theory that we've thrown out there seems to be perfect until something else like this pops up. It kind of breaks our, our idea of what we think are the patterns that we're seeing. So we're still looking for them, still trying to make those associations. But the one thing these guys have in common is they're all showing up in the burn. And we're happy to see every one of them. So just up here on this log, you'll notice this entire log is full of this massive cup fungus. I mean, these are really good size. If I come up to this one, this is kind of like a medium sized one and you can see my fingers here for scale. So this is a Paziza cup of some sort in this burn area. We've got a nice kind of velvety white exterior, kind of a brownish, orangish interior. If I move down here, you can see another really good sized one. Just beautiful to look at. something. Look at that. So a lot of these ascomycetes are pressure sensitive. So if they get a strong gust of wind or if you blow on them or even just tap them, oftentimes right after that they'll release a little puff of spores into the air. So cool to see. We can see a smaller, different little cup right there. But this guy, just a real stunner. So cool to see. So check this out. So we're just down in this floodplain, chasing these burn morels, and we came across this. So growing off of what appears to be an old cottonwood log, that's kind of been down here doing its thing. It got a little bit charred in the burn, but you can see that there's still a little moss up top that's doing fine. And we've got this significant flush here of a really cool mushroom. So take a look at this. So it's got this almost caramel color, 
on the young ones, we can see that stipe kind of looks silky or snakeskin like almost. If we peek out there, you can see or get a glimpse of the gill structure as well as an annulus. That's that little ring that's up there. So I believe that what we're looking at is actually an extremely toxic mushroom. This is what's commonly referred to as the funeral bell. Gallerina marginata. And take a look at this, just beautiful. Look at this flush that we've got here. Notice that little kind of auburn or almost like a reddish look on the outside or on the margin of that cap. Really something to look at. And as I pan down here, you can see some older ones that are quite a bit shriveled up. So a really cool opportunity to get to see this one in its very youngest stage, as well as some of its older stages. Just beautiful. And we can see that color change too. So these older ones, not only has the cap flattened out considerably, but we've got that much darker color. You can notice a very slight umbo on some of these. So especially as I pan down here, it's not something that shows up on all of them. A lot of them are mostly flat at maturity here, but we can see some of these have a slight umbo in the center. And again, that really unique kind of colored margin and stipe. Let's go ahead and we'll pick one of these and we'll take a look at what it looks like underneath. So I'm just gonna reach under here. I can tell too, as I grab this, that it's got kind of a flattened, feels like a hollow stem. And we see that really unique kind of light brown gills. Boy, just a beauty. Look at that. Really something, so cool to see. Good one to be aware of if you're out here. I believe that this commonly gets confused with, or it's one that people worry about confusing with, the wild anoki, which we featured in videos past. And boy, you can see how. I mean, these have a similar profile, right? When we look at this mushroom, you can see very slight striations on the edges of those caps, just like an anoki. But you might recall when we were talking about the anoki, one of the things that we looked at to assure that it was a safe mushroom is the anoki lacks this annulus or this little ring, right? Furthermore, you'll remember the wild anoki had a white spore print, whereas this one, you can kind of see that this spore print is gonna be a brown spore print. And we can see that really clearly on a lot of these. So this is one of those ones that I don't see it very often at all, but it's one of those ones that we really wanna be familiar with, especially if we're harvesting anything that looks remotely close to this. So again, kind of flimsy hollow stipe. There you can really see that spore color kind of left a little print on the gills or some of the spores left over. Here you can see a little bit of a spore print on the cap of the one that that was hanging over. And there we go, dark brown spore print. Or you could argue rusty brown as well but definitely not white. So really cool to see. This is the funeral bell, Gallerina marginata. So I'm just still down here by the river in this burnt out area. And just wanted to highlight this real quick. So check out this area where this log or root has just burned a little corridor straight through here. I wanted to pause and just check this out for a quick sec because there's all kinds of cool stuff going on in here. So nothing in the way of morels, but what you'll notice, and we're seeing these all over the forest floor, are these other ascomycetes. So if I give this guy a little bit of a tug, we'll just kind of investigate this. So there's this whole class of fungi that we refer to as pyrophilus fungi. So these are the fire-loving mushrooms. They come in after you know a fire and there's different species that come in the first year there's different ones that come in the second year this is a first year species this one 
is Geopixis carbonaria. In this one, there's one other Geopixis, so same genus that will show up. That one, Vulcanalis. But this one, I can tell that this is the carbonaria because we've got this outer edge or ridge that's kind of like this beige color. You'll also notice this slight little stipe or stalk. So the Vulcanalis will lack that stipe and it'll also lack this beige uh, edge or margin. So if we look here, this one is a little bit of a mystery to me. So this is something that's a little bit different. I suppose it's possible that that could be just in a different stage of growth, but it looks quite a bit different to me. So you can see how it's kind of clustered there and it's got that real distinct cup shape. Whereas these guys down here could be that they're just more mature, right? This could be a younger patch on the right hand side, but we see those really distinct features of the stipe and then that beige ring on the other side. Another one that we see if we just kind of look across the way here. So we see a lot of this one, of this purple Ascomycete. And you can see this one, very slight cup structure, just kind of breaks away like that. This is also one that we're seeing frequently in this burn area. So all these Ascomycetes, that's probably in the Paziza uh, genus, I would suspect, although I'm not 100% sure of the identity of that. If you know exactly what that one is, let me know in the comments. I'd be curious to hear from you. But super cool to see. I just wanted to take a quick second to appreciate all these cool pyrophilus fungi that are moving in after the fire and just really doing their thing. I've heard all kinds of different theories about you know what's going on with these. And in fact, there was a study recently out of the University of Illinois and Tennessee, I believe, in Great Smoky Mountain National Park, where they were looking at how these fire-loving fungi, the pyrophilus species, how they're so successful immediately after these fires. Because sometimes you'll see these a matter of weeks after a fire. And what they kind of theorized or their hypothesis was that perhaps these fungi were actually hiding out in lichen. And so um, they did extensive research on that, both lichens and mosses, and they found DNA of these, you know, pyrophilus fungi in the lichen. So it seems likely that that may be a part of their strategy, right? Like, so once an area gets cleared out, the lichen gets burned, they survive, and they're able to kind of take hold of these soils and kind of have the place to themselves for a little while to get a nice start. There's also, uh, I'm quite sure, you know, some very important ecological roles that they're playing, right? I've heard that they likely play a role in stabilizing soil and um, contributing to, you know, just holding things together, fighting against erosion. All of those things are super fascinating to me. And I know, you know, there's still a lot to learn about that stuff for sure, um, but, super fascinating love being in a new region and the burn and just seeing all kinds of new stuff and learning about it so very cool and just up here tons more of these huge cups check this out so here's my hand for perspective so this thing just massive let's give this a quick chance to uh show its stuff. Just here underneath a great big black cottonwood, got a couple more verpas poking out. So take a look, if you look inside of this, so unlike the true morels, you can see for one thing, the cap is free, right? So it's not connected to the stipe. So that cap is free hanging, but we also see this pithy core in here. So if we were to cut this open, it would be full of a pith-like kind of cottony core. Um, so that's a really huge differentiating factor and a good way to identify these if you have any doubts, whether you've got a true morel, or one of these early morels. 
got another one here and you can see that exact same thing going on there if i look down here you can see i've never seen one without that pithy core so interesting to see i'm going to harvest these give them a sample at home so I just returned to the original forest, just came up from that floodplain forest that we were exploring. Boy, both have been just a joy to explore and to just kind of scour in search of fungi. And boy, I can't help but marvel at how perfectly built this forest is that we're in right now for fire. Not only do we have, you know, some older growth Douglas firs that have healthy enough bark to sustain a fire, but we've also got a lot of these lodgepole pines that are, boy, are they perfectly built for fires. They've got serotonous cones that contain cones that are sealed with resin that contain, you know, thousands of tiny little seeds. And when I say tiny, I mean really tiny. I've read that it would take 100,000 seeds just to get you a pound of weight. So interesting to think that when we really take the big picture of forest ecology out here, you know, we tend to suppress fire and think of it as always being a bad thing. But in fact, you know, a lot of these forests depend on fires and that can be a healthy thing for a lot of these, especially when we have fires that kind of burn through and burn off some of the understory, but don't reach the canopy. And when I look around this particular forest, I see a lot of signs of a healthy burn. You know, we look down here, we see, you know, Douglas fir cones that have been dropped along with fir needles, right, that have come off from the burn. Also lodgepole pines, cedar fronds. So, you know, as we look out over the horizon and we look up into the canopy, we see lots of signs of life. We see a green canopy. You can see up these Douglas firs, the fire crept up to a decent height, but it didn't get up into the crown or the canopy, which is such a good thing. And I just think about these lodgepole pines in particular, those cones, the resin melting away and distributing seeds. Look under here, look who's hiding. So just to give you a quick update on what I'm seeing out here. So I'm seeing lots of small little burn morels up here in this lodgepole pine dominant forest. These guys are not as big as I was expecting, uh, honestly. So, you know, last week I was seeing similar sizes. They're a little bigger right now, but in my opinion, they've still got a ways to go. So we're still early. So if you're viewing this right now, I think, you know, a week or two from now, depending on what this temperature and precipitation game gives us, we're going to be in good shape. So we've got signs of good things to come out here. In every little nook and cranny here, we've got little burn morels starting to poke their way out, looking to just kind of break through and, and do their thing. So I'm confident that over the course of the next week or two, especially with the temperatures that I'm seeing, I think, you know, that to be honest, I think that the daytime highs have been just fine, but those overnight lows have been poking down into the 30s still. And I think that that's kind of confused some of these burn morels or at least stunted their growth a little bit. So my suspicion is, is that, you know, once we get just a few degrees higher on those overnight lows, boy, I think we're going to start really filling, filling our baskets. So anyhow, it has been an absolute pleasure out here. And uh, if you, I'd encourage you, if you've got a burn near you, get out, explore that burn, see what you see. And uh, remember, if you're liking these videos, hit that like button, subscribe, stay tuned, and until next time, happy trails.